The Rebel Capitalist Show. You know, we think about, or I think about the Venezuelan economy. I, I've got a lot of real estate and I do a lot of business in Colombia and I've got a lot of employees, in fact, that fled Venezuela, the hyperinflation. And uh, there's a lot of problems there, of course, but one of their main problems is they built their entire economy around one thing. So if that one thing crashes, you got big problems. And it just seems the, the, the more I look around the United States, the more it, it seems like we're doing the exact same thing in the sense that we're building our entire economy around one thing, and that's asset prices. Uh, but like oil did in Venezuela, at some point those asset prices can come down and then you know you bring the whole economy down with it if you got all your eggs in one basket. But that takes me to my next question. I was listening to your, your recent podcast interview with our, our good friend Danielle DiMartino Booth and you guys started talking about MMT and something that I've been trying to think through and that's Janet Yellen becoming the Treasury Secretary and kind of one of the first things you do with MMT is you want to combine the balance sheet of the Fed and the Treasury. So now you can turn these bank reserves into legal tender, to use Dr. Lacey Hunt's terminology. And I, I thought, my goodness, if, if I wanted to do that, the first person I'd hire is Janet Yellen. <laughs> I think you guys said kind of the same thing. So uh, I, I know you've probably had time to think about your conversation. Can you expand on that? Yeah, so I think I think MMT started um, in late 2019 when the the uh, the basis trade blew up, which was, you know, hedge funds using um, the uh, uh, repo market to leverage up, you know, spreads on treasury bills into you know, tens and billions of hundreds of billions of dollars. And when that trade started to blow up and we saw, you know, basis rates just kind of, you know, the repo rates, sorry, go to the moon, that that's when the Fed had to come in and step in. So what really happened there was we had a trillion dollar deficit during an economic expansion, 5% um, of GDP, roughly, um, during an, never, never seen before. Um, you know, uh, the closest thing was, you know, 2% of GDP in the 60s. Um, but this was, you know, a result of the tax cut, corporate tax cut, which forced the Treasury to go, OK, now we need to issue an extra trillion trillion dollars a year uh, in debt. And there just wasn't a market for that. There wasn't enough buyers for those Treasury bills. And so the, it turned out the only people who was really who were really buying those Treasury bills were hedge funds who were leveraging, you know, up to the hilt, very similar to long term capital management. Right. When that started to unwind, the Fed had to come in and say, OK, we're going to prop up. Uh, repo, the repo market, and we're going to start buying treasury bills because there, there just isn't a natural market for this. And so to me, that was when, Q, you know, QE of the past was we're going to just try and, and prop up asset prices. QE in 2019 changed to where the Fed said we have to start monetizing the debt. There just aren't enough buyers. Yeah. And so to me, that's when MMT started. And okay. A good example of you see the the balance sheet the the you know the debt issuance and the balance sheet go in the same exact direction right last year we saw uh, three four trillion dollars with the stimulus how far did the Fed balance sheet have to expand three four trillion dollars because there aren't natural buyers for that so the Fed is saying we're going to have to we're just monetizing everything and even Jay Powell has said to Congress do what you have to do we'll monetize it right. to me that is is um, you know, uh, fiscal dominance, where the Fed is now subject to the Treasury. And mm -hmm. it's perfect, you know, let's put Janet Yellen in charge of this, because now Jay Powell is essentially subservient to her. Whatever we're going to do with the Treasury, you guys have to monetize. And to me, that's really important, because, you know, that's, that's a jumping off point to something we've never seen in this country. Right. where we're going to print money to pay for whatever the country wants to spend on, whether it's infrastructure or just helicopter money sending checks to people. We're doing all of this right now. And it opens up uh, the possibility of runaway inflation. Um, and to me, that's why I'm watching the dollar, because if the dollar goes down against these other major currencies, it's a sign that people are losing faith uh, in the value of the currency. And that that could be very that could create an inflationary spiral, which which would be, you know, very 
painful for, for a lot of reasons. And so I think people don't appreciate that that risk is real today. Um, and and uh, uh, it, it could have, you know, major implications for markets and the economy. I really want to get your opinion on commodities, because it's another thing that I've been trying to think through. And we talk about all this money printing and say, my goodness, you got to have some type of uh, hard asset. And some of those commodities do well with even the left's type of infrastructure spending or the Green New Deal. And I, I love commodities back in March. But now you've seen copper and a lot of other things really have a, have a run. At last time I checked, oil is around 50, 52, something like that. So do you think that what, what's your long term view on commodities, first and foremost? And do you think that right now it's, it's a good time to look at them or maybe just uh, there's too much emotion and then maybe they're overbought right now? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think we are at the, in the very beginning of a new commodity super cycle. I think you see these things move in, in big waves. And I think over the last 40 years, you've, you've generally wanted to own financial assets over real assets. Financial assets since 1980 have, you know, outperformed everything. I do think we are at a turning point here where financial assets are not going to be the primary way, you know, to, to make money over the next five, 10 years. It's going to be you want to focus on real assets. And, um, you know, that's types of real estate, that's commodities, that's precious metals, um, those types of things. I do agree with you, I think, in the short run that, uh, you know, a lot of these commodities may be overbought. And I think we, we do have some deflationary risks over the next few months with, you know, rolling lockdowns and things in, in different places. And, and that could cause, you know, a correction in a lot of these things. But uh, I wrote a piece about energy, um, you know, the energy sector, traditional oil, um, you know, back in September, October. Since then, a lot of those energy stocks are up, have literally gone up 100 percent in the last, you know, two, three months. And so I do think a lot of those are overbought. But I I do think oil prices, um, especially are the ones that I'm, I'm most interested in, I think we could see, you know, in the next few years, oil shortages and things that are totally unimaginable um, to people today who think oil's done. You know, we're never, you know, we're, we're going to stop using oil and we're never going to need it again. We've seen so much, um, you know, production shutdowns of, uh, you know, shale oil in the, in the U.S., that when the economy reopens, you know, could we could see oil prices, you know, scream higher. Now they've they've rebounded really nicely already. So you know, like I said, over the next few months, it's kind of iffy. But but I do think, yeah, we we probably commodities are a much better bet than financial assets over the next five ten years. Makes sense. Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they get hyper focused on the demand, and they completely forget the supply side of the equation. You know, you can yeah. have demand go down, but if supply goes down faster, you still have prices going up. Yeah. So you see, so in oil, it's interesting. We've had, you know, uh, so much production shut down. And then think about, you know, just think about the pent up demand for energy. So, you know, everybody thinks shale, you know, is going to be able to meet that those de de demands from, you know, pent up demand once the economy reopens. Everyone's going to want to drive, visit family, fly, go on vacations, all this stuff. Where's all that product going to come from? Uh, when the economy reopens, it could, you know, could be very, very bullish for energy. Yeah, and you have less capital going into new production because of ESG and that whole. Uh, that Absolutely, whole and that's what people don't get is there's so much money going into new energy, alternative energy. Th that means mathematically, it's mathematically certain the returns from those things are going to be worse because there's so much capital flowing there. There's been no capital flowing into energy over the last you know month, two months, and, and there's so much you know uh, angst towards even allowing that, that what people don't appreciate is, okay, the more you know, ecologically uh, you know, sensitive you get in terms of economic policy and all these things, the more the oil price is gonna go up. You know, if you take away capital from it, that means you know, oil is just gonna get more valuable. And so you know, that's actually, people think, well, Everything's going ESG and, you know, all these uh, countries around the world are going to, you know, be anti-oil. Well, that, that's, that actually right there is probably one of the most bullish things for the oil price you could imagine. They're going to ban, you know, you know, oil drilling and all these things. It just makes the oil price go to the moon. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting.